Not all of us receive the ends that we deserve. Many moments that change a life's course. A conversation with a stranger on a ship, for example. A pure luck. And yet, no one writes you a letter, or chooses you as their confessor, without good reason. This is what she taught me. You have to be ready in order to be lucky. You have to put your pieces into play. When my day came, it was so hot that my armpits had made moons on the blouse the shoe shop supplied to every employee. You're listening to the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to WH Smith. Hello, my name is Liz Nugent and I am the writer of Lying in Wait. My husband did not mean to kill Annie Doyle, but the lying tramp deserved it. My name is Keith Stewart. The key inspiration for Boy Made of Blocks was definitely my own son, Zach, who is on the autism spectrum and did discover his creativity and his voice through playing Minecraft. I don't know what inspired me to start writing. I've always written. I've written since I was a little girl. It's a kind of thing that's just very much who I am. My name is Jessie Burton. I'm the author of The Muse. I'm the author of Goats and Sheep and my name is Joanna Cannon. I like most of the writing process, I have to say, but I'm quite a big fan of editing. Um, I think of it as ironing words, and I like to edit as I go along, so I will stare at a comma for 45 minutes and decide if it deserves to live or not. Suddenly, Lily was standing in the doorway, staring out at the vast white snow-covered horizon. Outside. She was outside. My name is Holly Overton, and I'm the author of Baby Doll. I always write on my bed. It's a peculiar thing. Sabine Durrant, author of Lie With Me. I sit on the bed with a cat, sometimes a dog, but the dog's not really allowed on the bed. And the laptop, which occasionally gets rather too hot, and I have to put it on the floor to rest a bit. Hello, my name is Bryony Gordon, and I am the author of Mad Girl. I need to be honest with you from the start, because as you will see, this is an honest book. A self-indulgent, self-flagellating, self-loathing book, but an honest one all the same. I am Samuel Bjork, the author of uh, I Am Travelling Alone. The hardest thing about writing for me is getting in this mode of sort of leaving the real world and entering this fictional world. Hello and welcome to the Richard and Judy Book Club in conjunction with WH Smith and this is our spring list. Lots of lots of lovely, wonderfully readable books to take you through to the summer. And the first person on our list is the marvellous Jessie Burton, who has followed up the huge success of The Miniaturist with her new one, The Muse. Hello, Jessie. Hello. Lovely to see you again. Lovely Lovely to see you. You don't half choose subjects that need an awful lot of research, (laughs) don't you? I know. I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment. Let's set the scene. First of all, this book is half set in the 1960s. In London. In London. And half in 1936? Yeah, 1936. In Spain? Spain. Yeah. Right. Eve of the Revolution. Okay. Indeed. Mm. Do you, I mean, are you, we'll we'll go into the narrative in a minute, but are you deeply attracted to historic subjects? I mean, is that what really, what gets you going when you're writing? I suppose, given the two books I have written, you would think so. I I don't know. I I suppose so. I think it's... um, I'm always interested in, in previous eras, how people used to live and in the way that there are so many similarities in terms of human nature yeah. and love and grief and fear yeah. and worry and, you know, particularly in the muse, the sort of shifts of nationalistic feeling and yeah. war and, yeah. um, and art and creativity, right. these things, you know, constantly crop up. So let's, let, let's talk first of all about Odell, who in the 1960s is a young immigrant woman from mm. Trinidad. Yep. And the only work that she can get in London is working in a shoe shop. Dulcis. Mm. I remember Dulcis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then she gets a lucky break. She gets a job as a secretary in a very prestigious London arts institute, mm-hmm. basically. Um, and that is uh, her, her, the first realisation because she knows she wants to write. She knows she's she, she knows she's got huge stories in her head, and that's the, this is the first chance she really gets it. How did you come across the character of Odell? Um, I think I've always been very interested in. Britain's colonial legacy and particularly how it's lived out by ex-colonial, mm. um, you know, ex-British, yeah. if you like, sort of um, people in London, particularly, yeah. but also England. And how, you know, 
the history of these islands, let's say the West Indies, is absolutely interconnected with the history of this island, mm. the British yeah. Isles. And, and I feel sometimes that there's a broken bridge there that I people completely don't agree with you. Yep. realise this, yep. um, particularly in terms of the slave trade um, and the sugar trade and, to, you know, cotton and, all, and cocoa and, all, and the, the wealth of Britain was essentially built on the, these oh, islands but it's as us well. That's, it's us that's forgotten that. It's not yeah. what used to be empire at all, is no, it? No, uh, right. but, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of education. It's a question of what is taught at school. When I was at school, we were just taught a little bit about the Atlantic slave triangle, but nothing about, oh, the Victorian Industrial Revolution mm. and steam engines, but not where, you know... All is it because we feel guilty about it? I think... I think so. I yeah. think I mean I think perhaps more than other countries Britain has done more to look back and to understand the sort of multicultural legacy of its previous you know governments and mm. behaviors mm. Um, but I, I, so that was you know very interesting to me to maybe create a girl who feels British mm who also feels Trinidadian, who has been brought up with Princess Margaret posters on the wall and, you know, knowing better Tennyson and Shakespeare poems than the average, you know, Brit on the street <laughs> in she, London. She had an intensely good education Yeah, in and they did. They were very well educated. And then when she gets to the Institute, you inject this wonderful concept. I really like it because it, all of us who've looked at great paintings, or any paintings really, you wonder what they're really telling us. Mm. You wonder what was going through the mind of the artist when it was painted <laughs> and, and what it's really meant to represent and, and what inspired it, what, what it's recording and all of that. And Odell sees a very interesting painting yeah. and she shows it to her mentor at the Institute or the mentor sees it and the mentor's reaction is very interesting. She sort yeah. of goes pale and gasps yeah. and we know straight away as a reader <laughs> this painting is, is very significant. Yeah. Explain how it takes us back to 1936 Spain. Well this painting um, turns up at the Skelton Art Institute and it's identified as being painted by a young Spanish painter called Isaac Robles who died allegedly at the in during the Spanish Civil War and he was sort of a contemporary of Picasso he was going to be as big as him he was doing really exciting kind of unusual paintings and any artwork by him is incredibly rare and incredibly sought after. So this is a real find? Yeah this is this yeah. astonishing find um, and Marjorie Quick, who is the mentor of Adele, sort of okay. sees this painting is just utterly, you know, as you say, she sort of goes pale, she acts really oddly um, in, in front of it. And I take you back as the reader back to 1936 to this rather kind of hodgepodge of a family. There's a, an, an English heiress, Sarah, um, her Viennese Jewish art dealer husband, and their single daughter, oh. Olive Schloss who is a deeply gifted painter, a quite troubled girl. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that I communicated to the reader how confident mm. Olive is in her talent. Um, she believes in herself. She believes in her painting. She's almost, you know, for me, a kind of um, play on the idea of that male genius of art yeah, who, yeah. who doesn't care about his relationship, mm. doesn't care. About, Olive is kind of like that. She's an art monster. And, and yeah. that was fun to write. And she counteracts Adele in the 60s, who is a writer who is also very talented and gifted, but is much more diffident and unsure about how to be public with her art. And in terms of the, the way that those two timelines work, it's very important to remember that, that we're comparing the 60s to the 30s. Yeah. It's not like 80 years ago as we are now. Actually, the, 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 the gap in time is, is relatively short. It it's is. about 30 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, it is short, um, but so much happened in those 30 <laughs> years. Oh, Spanish Civil War, Second World War, yeah. you know, the invention of the pill. You know, all this stuff really changed and mass immigration as well, you know, yeah. they are very different And yet, periods. you know, to, 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 to misquote the, the French phrase, you know, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. Well, exactly. And, the, and this is where we came in, really, that, that actually the way we behave as humans here in London, where we're recording this today, is fundamentally no different to the way the Romans were behaving no. 2,000 years ago. And no. The way they were in, interacting and talking and mm. shouting and arguing and eating and squabbling, <laughs> squabbling. it's the same. It's yeah, the same. and the fear of the other and Absolutely. all of yeah. that sort of and, thing. Yeah, it's all there. I mean, coming back to the title, The Muse, mm. um, Basically, this is a novel about talent, isn't it? It's about yeah. female talent. Yes. Specifically female talent. Yes. And um, the ways that these people are enabled, these women, mm -hmm. are enabled to realise their talent, and it's not really through men at all. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. It is a kind of meditation on creativity, and particularly women who want to be creative, and yeah. the dilemmas they face about their public persona with their private... Um, because, I mean, creativity. Olive's father thinks she's rubbish. Yeah, well, he, he essentially <laughs> says women can paint. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying they can't be 
artists. No. And there's this kind of lexicographical just sort of difference and it's like, what do you mean? And what does that really mean? What's genius? And I, I feel that so often in the history of literature, the history of art, the history of everything, natural authority has just always been placed at the feet of men and, and right. it's probably done by other men too and it's been just built up over the mm. centuries and Olive Olive grows up with that she sees that her father's only in his art gallery really and the men and women coming to buy his art are really only buying male artists mm. um, and so she decides she takes this into her own hands. She has belief in herself. She just doesn't have belief in the art market. So she yeah. decides to subvert it. Um, and it was very fun for me as a writer myself to create these two creative women yeah. mm. um, and to play around with, the, the, you know, I don't have a constant attitude to my own creativity. And so mm. I was exploring that imbalance yeah. through Adele and, and Olive. And, you know, Marjorie Quick is, is a kind of invention for me. She's a facilitator. She's the confidence booster. She's the one that takes Adele's talent to the public. Yeah. Right. Now, like, like some of the contestants on Pointless, you've been, you've been here before. You're, <laughs> I, you're, I a, you're a second time around her with, as you said, the, the miniaturist. How many novels have you written now? I've written two. That's it. Oh, yeah. I, thought there was one. One. I thought it was a no, third one no, in no, between. No, no, this is two and two Oh, years. my goodness. Yeah. Well, that, that, that lends even more point to the question then. Um, how, how much more difficult was it writing a second book than the first? <laughs> I think it was so different. Um, the first, I suppose you could say, was written with absolutely no expectation. I was writing into the dark. I didn't have an agent. I didn't have a publisher. I had no right. guarantee of anything. <laughs> and in, in, in some ways, I will never get that innocence back. Um, and then the second book was written under contract, <laughs> under the sort of great, glorious, benign weight of the miniaturist. Um, and I knew that a publishing team were waiting, a publicity team, a marketing team, the whole oh, shebang. Tell just me about oh my it. God, it's really, yeah, exactly. Oh, you know exactly how it is. And I was just thinking, this is not how I create <laughs> stuff. I'm, this is horrific. Um, and I think actually the muse mutated as a book in response to my own personal experiences. I would argue that this book is more autobiographical than my first really because it is about the creative space being invaded and commodified by external pressure. Yeah, but also out of necessity too. I don't, I don't write a four years of a book just to shove it in a drawer. It's too much like hard work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I want people to read it, but it's this strange um, journey that I went through um, you know, from obscurity to mass attention. Mm. And I think The Muse is a kind of self-therapizing, yeah. mm. um, at times angry book, but also understanding that all that matters to me is the work, is yeah. the creativity, is the typewriter, is the words. And there are certain characters in this book that absolutely agree with me and identify mm. with that. And that's the most important thing at the end of the day. And what sort of what next? I mean, because you, you I mean, you're very much sort of seen now um, as, as a writer who delves into other periods mm. of, of history. Um, are you already working on your next one? Um, I'm not working on any novel at the moment. I've kind of got a few ideas. Um, I know that I do seem to be sort of fixated on the past. But you don't I, have to be, though, do you? No, you I don't just, think I will be. I, no. I think, you know, I had a personal interest in Spain and the Spanish Civil War. I, I lived there um, in South Spain. And, right. Um, and obviously the miniaturist, uh, the Dutch Golden Age, really interested me. N nothing else has really spoken to me yet. I'm right. kind of marinating my brain a bit. <laughs> Um, well, I'm you, doing could, you could look to the future, couldn't you? Do a kind of rewrite of the, Je the Jetsons or something. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm, I don't Go know. On. Speculative fiction. It's. It's. I don't know if that's really my bag. But um, I'm looking at at the moment. I'm writing a children's fairy tale. Oh, re lovely. Rewrite. Um, and that's you know a complete palate cleanser. Very different um, kettle of fish. Well. Yeah. Um, when Sir Lawrence Olivier was alive, he used to go around to see friends who were in turkeys of a play. And what do you say to a friend when you go to his dressing room when you, they're, they're in a turkey? And apparently his, his former words was, darling, you've done it again. Uh, <laughs> in a totally different spirit, we say to you, Jessica, darling, you've done it again. Because it's a, a fascinating. Good, fascinating. Fascinating and more than worthy follow-up to the miniatures. You're incredibly generous. Thank it's you. true. It wouldn't listen. It wouldn't be on the list if it wasn't. <laughs> um, it's The Muse by Jesse Burton. And uh, obviously you can get it from all sorts of outlets and online and all. But if you happen to stroll into W. H. Smith, you get a special edition of the book, only there, uh, with extra content at the back, including uh, a special Q&A that we do with the author, little articles, all sorts of insights and things, which you simply won't get if you get a copy anywhere else. So, you know, it might be worth popping down to the high street. Thanks, Jessie. Thank you very much, Jessie. My name is Jessie Burton, and I'm the author of The Muse. Writing or reading? 
Reading. Fact or fiction? Fiction. Keyboard or pen? Keyboard. Writing in silence or with background noise? Always in silence. Can't do it with music. Hard copy or e-reader? Hard copy, but I also have an e-reader because they can be quite useful and you know, going on holiday. Keep books or pass them on? I keep my books. I can't pass them on. <laughs> People can get their own damn books. <laughs> Who reads your first draft first? I do. <laughs> What's your favourite genre? I don't have one. I just read whatever attracts me and, you know, if I open the first two or three pages. I read quite widely. What's your favourite book? Oh my gosh, how am I supposed to answer that? Um, what's my favourite book? This is horrendous. Um, uh, okay, um, okay, a book that I, you know, would go back to again and again and reread and love. Um, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Best thing about being a writer? <laughs> that I get to make up imaginary worlds for a living. The Richard and Judy Book Club has plenty of great offers in store and online, exclusive to WH Smith. Yeah, The Muse is a, is a fascinating book. Um, basically, it's about two women in two completely separate periods of time and two completely separate countries. Odell, a very young woman who's just emigrated into uh, 60s London, where she can, she's a very, very clever woman, she's very bright, and she's a very talented writer, and that's what she wants to do, but the only job she can get is in a shoe shop. Dulces. Dulces, shoe shop. Iconic, iconic And then she gets, she gets a lucky break and gets a job as a secretary at a very prestigious uh, institute in, in London. Uh, where an, she an art institute. Yeah, an art yeah. institute, where she is mentored by a woman who is, does her an enormous amount of good, who kind of brings her on, recognises her talent, brings her on and... But well, she um, can see that she has the eye. She, she has the eye for a good painting. And there's this fantastic moment quite early on, um, which really gets the story going, where a, a painting is presented to this, uh, this institute for examination. And her mentor, who's extremely knowledgeable about art, um, is completely thrown off balance by this. She looks at it, just takes one look at this painting, and she kind of goes white as a sheet. And you know instantly that there's something about this old, this old painting which has its own story, not just the story of the painting, but something else. And I, what I loved about that scene was that I have often wondered that, looking at, at paintings, whether they're by old masters or, or people you've never heard of before, what that painting's really saying to you, what the circumstances of the person at the time when they painted it really was, and if that's kind of come through somehow. And I love that kind of... Well, I suppose story within a story idea, a painting within the painting. I thought that was a terrific thought. Well, we, that, that takes us back to 1936 and uh, Spain in the Spanish Civil War. Um, <clears throat> and we discover that the painter, um, although not credited with that painting at that time, is a woman, a young woman called Olive, who is a brilliant painter, but is finding it incredibly difficult to be taken seriously because she's a woman. And in fact, that kind of sums up the whole book. Odell is finding it difficult to be taken seriously as a writer because she's a, a young black woman in the 60s. Yep. And in the 30s, Olive is finding it difficult to be taken seriously by the art market because she's a woman. Well, as the author tells us, there, were, there was a point in history when women, yes, they were allowed to paint, but they weren't allowed to be artists. No. <laughs> What's the difference? I think we're like most people, aren't we, as readers, Judy? I mean, why do you think we, we like to read the same author over and over again? Well, I suppose the extremely predictable answer is you, you know what you're getting. If you've read a book by someone who's writing you really like, who's plotting you really like, um, then you're attracted to, to their next one because you've fallen in love with the first one. Well, it's almost like going to the same restaurant and having the same meal, isn't it? Which I suppose explains, I mean, I think I Not do... Not really. Well, I think so. I think, it's a, I think that's a reasonable same analogy. Restaurant. I'd be happy to put that in the printed book, do you? But same a, restaurant, yeah. but not having necessarily the same meal. Ah, but you see, that's what I was leading on to. I was going to say, for example, I read every year A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. I, I mean, I know every page of that book, every line of that book. Why do I read it every year? I don't know, Richard. Why do you read it? <laughs> All right, then. I shall answer my own question. <laughs> to put me in the Christmas spirit. OK. And it does. Next time. Well, we have some Nordic noir coming your way on the Book Club podcast. 
when we hear from Norway's latest publishing sensation. I had only the crime, I had no investigators, and she sort of just appeared to me alone on this island, and I, I wanted someone who had trouble. Samuel Bjork is the name on the book, but there's more to the author of I'm Travelling Alone, as you'll find out exclusively when you come back next time to the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast. <laughs>